สิใครขอย่าเป็นก้อนลำทรงเนเนอเจอป้าทรงอยากได้สู้ตั้งบานจึงจะตานเอวลำเมืองกัมพูชีเป็นประเทศเล็กที่มีความยาวนานมากเท่ากับประเทศอื่นๆที่มีความยาวนานมากเท่ากับประเทศอื่นๆที่มีความยาวนานมากเท่ากับประเทศอื่นๆที่มีความยาวนานมากเท่ากับประเทศอื่นๆที่มีความยาวนานมากเท่ากับประเทศอื่นๆที่มีความยาวนานมากเท่ากับประเทศอื่นๆที่มีความยาวนานมากเท่ากับประเทศอื่นๆที่มีความยาวนานมากเท่ากับประเทศอื่นๆที่มีความยาวนานมากเท่ากับประเทศอื่นๆที่มีความยาวนานมากเท่ากับประเทศอื่นๆที่มีความยาวนานมากเท่ากับประเทศอื่นๆที่มีความยาวนานมากเท่ากับประเทศอื่นๆที่มีความยาวนานมากเท่ากับประเทศอื่นๆที่มีความยาวนานมากเท่ากับประเทศอื่นๆที่มีความ A neighborhood that is sometimes friendly and sometimes hostile. Long, long ago, Cambodia had a high civilization, amazing hydraulic technology, the largest city in the world, an agricultural base that could produce three or four crops of rice per year, a well-nourished population, and a rich artistic culture. That produced some of the most beautiful temples and carvings in the world. It is believed that j a y a v a r m a n II, who lived from 770 to 835 A.D., established the first independent Khmer kingdom in the ninth century, and declared that he was the supreme ruler of this region, the Deva Raja, which means the God King. This kingdom is called c a m p u c h i a or c a m b o j a in the Khmer language. This Khmer empire lasted from the 9th to the end of the 15th century. A succession of powerful monarchs built upon j a y a v a r m a n s achievements to make it one of the greatest kingdoms in the world. In d r a v a r m a n I, 877 to 890. Created a sustainable water system. His son, Yasovarman (889–910), expanded this system of reservoirs, trenches, and canals. This wondrous technology provided the country with the ability to grow sufficient food for a burgeoning population, and to expand the economy by exporting the surplus. Sir Yasovarman II. 1113 to 1150, was one of the greatest of the monarchs. His empire grew to include most of Southeast Asia, but his chief legacy, the one for which he is most recognized, was the construction of the huge temple complex, Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat was sacked by its enemies, the Chans or Vietnamese, in 1177. Jayavarman the Seventh, 1181 to 1218, then established Angkor t o m and the Temple b a y o n as replacements. This temple was remarkable, with its 216 faces. Infinite Buddha statues, stone towers, and images of gods and kings. Angkor t o m became the capital, the largest city in the world. It is believed that while London's population was about 18,000 in the 12th century, Angkor's was between 200,000 and 750,000. A large, sprawling city. The size of Los Angeles in area. After j a y a v a r m a n s death, c a m b o j a declined. Like the Roman Empire, it never regained the strength that it had when Angkor Wat was abuzz with construction and housed a temple full of worshippers. Neighboring kingdoms looted the place and tried to destroy it. The kingdom lost its land. The water system eroded, and sadly, slowly, this glorious kingdom faded. Angkorian society was hierarchical. The monarch was divine. He owned everyone and everything. 
One level below the king and his family were the priests, about 4,000 in total in the 10th century. Below them were commoners with no rights, no land of their own, and who owed labor in lieu of taxes to the monarch. At the bottom were the slaves who supplied the labor to build all of the temples. The monarch and his court lived a life of absurd affluence while others lived in poverty. An account of how they lived was written by Zhu Daguan, a Chinese diplomat who spent 11 months from August 1296 until July 1297 living in Angkor Thom. Zhu describes Angkor Thom as a city surrounded by a moat that was guarded at all times and closed at night. The guards did not allow dogs or convicts to gain entry. To get in, people had to show their feet. Convicted criminals in the kingdom were punished by having their toes cut off, and so toes were the entry permit. People in Angkor, both men and women, wore no upper garments or shoes. Their sole apparel, except for jewelry, was a cloth that they wrapped around their lower bodies. Their houses contained no furniture. They cooked in simple clay pots and served with ladles made of coconut shells. All houses were made of wood and elevated on poles to protect against the monsoon rains. The Khmer believed that only the gods deserved to be housed in stone. For this reason, there is little left of the once huge city, the wooden buildings having burned and rotted over time. Women were the entrepreneurs. In the market, they sat on the ground, placing their wares on mats in front of them. For the privilege of using this space, they paid rent to the officials. The king and the court, on the other hand, lived in boundless opulence. The palace itself was 1.5 miles in circumference, covered in yellow tiles and surrounded by long colonnades. Whenever the king left the palace, he led a huge entourage, a show designed to dazzle and awe his subjects. Zhu describes it like this. When the king goes out, troops lead the escort. Then come flags, banners, and music. Palace women, numbering from three to five hundred, wearing clothes decorated with flowers and with flowers in their hair, hold candles in their hands, and form a troop. Even in broad daylight, the candles are lit. Then come other palace women, carrying lances and shields. Then the king's private guards. Then carts drawn by goats and horses, all in gold. Then ministers and princes mounted on elephants. Next, the wives and concubines of the king appear in palanquins, carriages, on horseback, and on elephants. Finally, the sovereign arrives, standing on an elephant, brandishing his sacred sword in his hand. His elephant's tusks are encased in gold. The technology required to serve Angkor Thom, the largest city in the world, was amazing for its time. The water management system that the Khmer developed was ingenious. They were expert water engineers. They dug canals, changed the course of rivers, built dikes, moats, and reservoirs called barays. The two main barays were the east and the west. The west barray contains water to this day, this water system spanned 460 square miles. Because there are wet and dry seasons in the region, the wet being very wet and the dry being very dry, these water systems allow the city of Angkor Thom to store water in the wet season and to avoid flooding in the dry season. This water was also used for irrigation, 
allowing the farmers to grow rice in the dry season. The canal served additionally for transportation. Tonle Sap Lake, the largest freshwater lake in Southeast Asia, is connected to the Mekong River by way of the Tonle Sap River, a river that flows one way during the wet season and in the other direction during the dry season. The Mekong is very much like the Nile in Egypt, whose annual floods deposit alluvial soil, making the region rich for farming. Angkor Wat was built by Sir Yaverman II at the beginning of the 12th century. There is some evidence that the king wanted to use this massive temple both as a holy place and his mausoleum. He wanted to build big, to impress all men and gods, and so he constructed the largest religious monument to date. It has survived along with the adjacent city Angkor Thom as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It receives more than one million visitors per year. Angkor Wat was a massive undertaking. It was to be built in the middle of a floodplain, one in which a thick tropical forest had to be leveled and where vicious insects inhibited the work. A great structure required a strong foundation. A deep pit had to be dug. Three or four layers of sand and gravel had to be laid in order to stabilize the ground. Even after all this preparation, the ground was still wet, and so the temple would have to be built like a great ship floating on a sea of subterranean water. But the water level could not vary in the wet and dry seasons, or the temple would become unstable crack and disintegrate. The engineers and architects dealt ingeniously with the physical problems of Angkor Wat. The temple is surrounded by waterways and reservoirs. The water from the 200 meter wide moat and from the reservoirs keep the water table constant all year round during both the wet and dry seasons thus stabilizing the temple. To keep the rigid schedule for completing the temple during the life of the monarch, the workers had to transport three to four hundred blocks of sandstone per day from the quarry, thirty kilometers away. Each block weighed between two and twelve tons. To do this, the workers floated sandstone blocks from the quarry on boats down the Siem Reap River. Construction required the labor of 3,000 workers and 6,000 elephants. In Europe, it took two to 300 years to build one cathedral. Angkor Wat was built in about 35 years. The care with which the sandstone blocks were laid allowed the sculptors to make large, uninterrupted carvings and bas-reliefs on the temple walls. The temple was originally Hindu in origin, devoted to the deity Vishnu. Sir Yaverman wanted this temple to be his legacy, a heaven on earth. But after his death, by the end of the 12th century, Buddhism became the preferred religion of the country, and so the temple, accordingly, became Buddhist. Nevertheless, the huge statue of Vishnu, the king's patron saint, still remains at the entrance, greeting all visitors. There are more than 1,000 separate temples that are part of the complex. Some are in good condition, and some have survived merely as a pile of rubble. Most of these are covered with carvings and bas-reliefs depicting contemporary themes, historic and mythological events and creatures. There are more than 800 bas-reliefs and 3,000 nymphs called in Khmer Apsara on the walls of the temple. Scholars try to fathom why the Angkor Kingdom fell. Some believe that the water system that supported the economy of Angkor Wat 
contributed to its demise. The system was very sophisticated and complex. To run well, it required constant maintenance, or it would become clogged with silt and weeds and fail to function. Absent this system, the Khmer could not grow multiple crops of rice per year, feed their population, or grow rich through their rice exports. Without this technology, the kingdom would be weakened over time. Other scholars believe that incessant wars weakened the kingdom. In any case, in 1431, Angkor was sacked by the Thais. This date marks the beginning of Angkor's ultimate decline. Cambodia then entered the dark ages and has never since returned to the bright times when Angkor was dominant. Over the next 600 years, there have been periods that were prosperous, more peaceful, and more stable than others, but there has never been a time approaching the glory days when the Khmer Empire was preeminent in Southeast Asia. In around 1864, Henry Muho, a French naturalist and explorer, wrote Travels in Siam, Cambodia, and Laos. This book was published posthumously. He describes Angkor Wat this way. At Angkor, there are ruins of such grandeur that at first view one is filled with profound admiration and cannot but ask what has become of this powerful race so civilized, so enlightened, authors of these gigantic works. He says that Angkor is grander than anything left to us by Greece or Rome and is a rival to the temples of Solomon. He also captures a little of the atmosphere of contemporary Cambodia when he writes, Every moment I met mandarins, either born in litters or on foot, the entire population numbers about 12,000 souls. Comparing this description to that of the Chinese diplomat Zhu Daguan in 1297, it is evident that there have been few changes in the intervening 567 years. In 1864, Cambodia became a French protectorate. Under this arrangement, the king became a figurehead, while the real power was in the hands of the French resident general. Nevertheless, the Cambodian people still saw the king as a god king. The French did make some positive changes by bringing peace to the country and building an infrastructure of roads and railroads. But over time, power in foreign hands grated on the Cambodian people and they wanted independence. From 1941 to 1945, Cambodia was occupied by Japan and Vichy France. When the war ended, the French government reasserted control over Cambodia. Cambodia, under Prince Sihanouk, gained independence from France on November 9, 1952. But history can be destiny. From the beginning, the Cambodian people were always ruled by the elites who took the resources of the whole country as their own. Prince Sihanouk was a man in this tradition who beat and killed opposition leaders, cheated in elections, 
nationalized and then stole the resources of his country and kept all sectors of society in check through political and religious intimidation. But for the most part, the people loved him, seeing him as the God King, part of their long-lasting tradition. And the country was stable. As hostilities between the U.S. and Vietnam heated up in the mid-1960s, Prince Sihanouk's support swung back and forth between communism and capitalism, between Vietnam and the U.S. He allowed the North Vietnamese to build sanctuaries in Cambodia and to use Cambodian ports to import war equipment. To compensate Cambodia, the Vietnamese bought rice at highly inflated prices. This money went into the pockets of Sihanouk and his cronies. At the same time, Sihanouk allowed the U.S. forces to bomb the Vietnamese sanctuaries and to pursue troops into Cambodia to kill them. He was playing a double game, one that benefited his bottom line but was devastating to the Cambodian people. Between 50,000 and 150,000 people were killed as the U.S. dropped bombs in 113,000 different locations, more bombs than had been dropped on Japan during World War II. Frightened people flooded into Phnom Penh to avoid this violence, many blaming King Sihanouk, turned to the Khmer Rouge, the Communist Party, for help. Civil war erupted between the Khmer Rouge and Sihanouk's government. In 1970, Sihanouk was overthrown. Angry, he joined the Khmer Rouge. In 1975, the Khmer Rouge captured the capital of Cambodia, Phnom Penh. This day is one of the blackest in history not only for Cambodia, but for all mankind. Paul Pot, the head of the Khmer Rouge, wanted to return to the golden age of Cambodian culture, one that was untainted by modernity. The professional class was doomed under his regime because they did not have pure Cambodian ideas. He declared it to be year zero, a time when all cultural and political norms would be overturned and a new Khmer nation would be born. The Khmer Rouge began their purification program, much like the Chinese had in their cultural revolution. They emptied Phnom Penh and sent all the people into rural work camps, gulags, or what they called rural cooperatives. It did not matter who you were or the state of your health. The Khmer Rouge emptied schools and hospitals. All inhabitants were required to leave. Some 20,000 hospitalized patients had to trek to the countryside. It is estimated that about 20,000 people died along the way. The Khmer Rouge believed that the educated class were parasites and killed most of them immediately. They killed Buddhist monks and banned religion. They killed ethnic minorities, Chinese, Muslims, Vietnamese, and all other foreigners, although many of these people have been living in Cambodia for generations. They killed people wearing eyeglasses. They killed teachers, engineers, doctors. They separated families, emptied cities, and closed schools. They shut down newspapers, radio stations, mail services, stopped issuing money, and confiscated bicycles. People became slave laborers and worked 16 and 18 hours a day with little or no food until they simply died of malnutrition or disease or just plain overwork. They stripped their subjects of any individuality they performed mass weddings among unwilling participants. Children were taken away from their families. 
From the very beginning of their tenure, the great hope of building a prosperous agricultural economy faded. Poor, hungry people do not make good workers. The rice they produced could not feed the population. Paul Pott was paranoid. He never accepted responsibility for the failures of his regime. When crops failed, he blamed one group after another, educated people, people from a certain region, or foreigners. As conditions worsened, Paul Pott's list of enemies expanded exponentially until he finally blamed his closest allies, those who fought with and beside him in the revolution. The most influential leaders were taken to the infamous prison, to all slang, also known as S-21, tortured mercilessly and finally killed. At the end, the Khmer Rouge overplayed its hand in hostilities with Vietnam. In 1978, Vietnam invaded Cambodia. It took only two weeks for Vietnam to win the war. Pol Pot left behind a ravaged land. Between 1.5 and 3 million Cambodians were killed, about one-fourth of the population. 23,745 mass graves have been found. 95% of Buddhist temples were destroyed. Of the 40,000 to 60,000 Buddhist monks in the country in 1975, only 800 to 1,000 survived. Teachers, doctors, engineers, scientists, lawyers, civil libertarians, anyone with an education was killed. When you visit Cambodia today, there are no obvious signs of the devastation wrought by the Khmer Rouge. But there is not a family in the country that has not suffered, and they are all carrying this pain in their hearts. Ross Pesyth, who calls himself Seth in English, recalls the difficult years under Paul Pot. In three years, eight months, 20 days, a powerful government kill 1.7 million people. This is the official record that we got from international court. And it has built, the government has built about 374 killing fields in the whole country. My father, he has hidden his history for two years, for two years. Actually, 1976, yeah, they're going to arrest him, but he ran away. He ran away from the village, yeah. But the Khmer Rouge and that government try, try to arrest him by stand, stay around that village or always go walk by my house. My father always give extra to the people who had complained, I'm so starved, I'm so hungry. That time of mango season, yeah, mango season, and some mango right and drop, drop on the ground, and he on the way, he picked mango and sent to me. But when he stepped into village, he was arrested by Gary Lang. I miss my father. I almost 44 years old, but I never heard my father's sound. I have never seen my father's face. I miss him. In choosing between the Khmer Rouge and a communist state, the U.S. and the West chose the Khmer Rouge. The Khmer Rouge government in exile represented the Cambodian government in the U.N. and in UNESCO until the Paris Peace Accords were signed in 1991 
and supervised elections were held in Cambodia. The Khmer Rouge leaders never did get the punishments that they deserved. The UN-backed court only managed to sentence a very few higher-level Khmer Rouge officers to prison. Paul Pot fled to his jungle hideout and died of natural causes in his own bed in 1998. In some ways, Cambodia is in a terrible state today. A country with a long history of rule by the very few has a hard time transitioning to democracy. Most people are very poor. Almost 80% live in rural villages, many without running water or electricity. Prime Minister Hun Sen, who had been a member of the Khmer Rouge, is the current leader. Under his tenure, newspapers and radio stations were forced to close. Opposition leaders who threaten his 30-year rule have a habit of dying, being jailed, or seeking asylum in other countries. Transparency International has named Cambodia as the most corrupt country in Southeast Asia, and it is probably one of the most corrupt in the world. And yet nothing has ever been fair to the Cambodian people. Corrupt government has followed corrupt government. Questionable election has followed questionable election. Opposition leaders are killed or jailed so that the strongest, most violent, and most insidious of leaders could prevail. In many ways, Cambodia has not changed since the 11th century, when the king was all-powerful and the impoverished people worked to secure his luxurious lifestyle. Resources now as then stay at the top layers of Cambodian society. And although the city dwellers are doing better with a stronger economy and the increase of tourism and with the investments of the Chinese government, they privately complain. They are not happy to have to pay kickbacks for everything they do. They would like free and fair elections. The government, not the people, have encouraged the one-sided trade with China. Truckloads of Cambodia's natural resources, such as gems and valuable trees, make their way to China every day. Yet despite the bad government and corruption, more young people are being educated than ever before. 40,000 enter university each year. These young people may not be happy with the status quo, but right now there is little that they can do. They know that Cambodia is a beautiful country, a rich tropical paradise. So many uninhabited beaches, so many rolling mountains, and lush rice paddies. Nature has bestowed many riches upon this lovely land. They know that the economy is growing at a phenomenal rate, that Phnom Penh, the capital, is booming, as evidenced by all the new construction, and that tourism in Siem Reap, the city of Angkor Wat, has increased exponentially. These are hopeful signs and bode a bright future. They also know that the lives of those who oppose the leadership are very short. So they wait. They hope. They aspire to a better Cambodia. They understand the beauty of the land and of its people and want to turn Cambodia into the wonderful place that it could be. Thank you.
ปากกันไอ้ขอยืนยันว่าบอกเพียนจังจะบอกหักยิ่งไหนสู้ชีวิตไปสุดเส้นทางความหักสอง